Hi, my name is Lauren. Today I have the blessing and privilege of sharing with you something that I have been challenged with lately. So there's two things that I've been challenged with lately. The first one is to know truth, to know God's truth. Lately I've been going on runs or just at home in some spare time listening to podcasts and to sermons. And God has really challenged me to look back at the Bible and to look at the scriptures and know his truth. So not just to take the pastor's word for granted or the person that's speaking on the podcast, but to go back to the scriptures and just check that it's biblical truth. The second thing that I've been challenged with lately is to have answers for my non-Christian friends, for people that don't believe, and even for my students in my grade six class. In a small table with a bunch of other girls, we've been reading a book called The Reason for God and Making Sense of God. It's by Timothy Keller. And in this book, he's written it from a secular viewpoint. So from an atheist, it goes through why they believe what they believe. And, and what their life is about, what they hold valuable and, and the meaning for life for them. And then he argues against that with the Christian faith and says, you know, why do we believe what we believe and how what we believe is truth. I've loved doing this Bible study with the girls and it's, it's just brought me closer to God. It's got me reading my Bible more and searching for truth. And I feel like I'm more prepared to give answers to people if they have answers as to why I believe what I believe and um, who is God to me. There is a verse that I got my grade six students to learn and it's just been one that has been really on my heart lately. It's Romans 12 verse two. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will know God's will, his good, pleasing and perfect will. I've been challenging my students to, to know what they believe and to be able to stand up for what they believe even when other kids are, are telling them that they shouldn't believe what they believe. And so this, this search for truth is something that has just been really on my heart lately. Hey everyone, <laughs> great to join you online. Here's a question, straight to it. What comes to your mind when you think of the word peace? I almost did the peace symbol then. What comes to your mind when you think of the word peace? Have a think. I wonder if it's anything like what came to my computer when I Googled the word peace. Some of the images are showing right now a, a, a couple by the beach looking at the calm waves, the peace symbol out of the 70s, uh, no war, anti-war, peace. Uh, someone sitting under a tree at night looking like they might be meditating, peace. And then someone up the top, top of a mountain probably after an early morning mountain climb looking at the sunrise, finding, reaching this state of peace. Is that what came to your mind? Is that what you expected? It was what I expected. Um, I think of peace as this reachable um, or this place that you try to try to get to, that you'll finally be at peace. I kind of picture because I'm such a surfer, <laughs> and you only know that that's a that's a complete joke if you know me because I've barely surfed, even though I live in Burley Heads. But I have that picture of the time I have attempted to surf, of what happens when you try to paddle out towards the bigger bigger waves is you actually have to get out the back of the smaller sets. And what happens is it's, there's a wave and then another wave and then another wave and you keep paddling through that wave and then that wave, but eventually you reach calm water. Out the back, a sense of reaching peace. That's what I've always kind of thought of when I think of the word peace. It's achievable, reachable place or state of being. Now, it's not 100% wrong, um, but like normal for this series, if you've been joining us in this Cultivating Fruit series, you'll know that true spiritual fruit, including peace, is not something you just have to try 
harder to get. <laughs> it's not something found with effort. It's not achieved through finding the perfect place, spot, or location. Now, this is not 100% wrong, but as you know from the series, if you've been following us in this Cultivating Fruit series, this fruit, and again with peace, is not just something you can try hard to force to get. It's not something that's reached. It's not a state that you'll finally get to, a location, a spot. After all, what if the waves, to go back to the surfer analogy, what if the waves keep coming? What if your life is just one wave after the other? What if you never reach in this life that state of peace? Then how does peace look? How do you produce the fruit of the Spirit in peace? Well, we're going to explore exactly that type of peace in just a moment. But first, just want to say, Hello, don't think I said that at the start. Great to have you here. A couple of things I want to make you aware of before we get back into our series. Um, look, I'd love to let you know how you can help us produce. If you're watching this, if you're enjoying this, if you've been challenged or encouraged by this online ministry, then I'd love to give you a couple of ways you can really, really, really help us out. First of all, if you're watching on the socials, you can subscribe, you can hit like, and you can comment. Let us know what you thought. Let us know what encouraged or challenged you in this video. Um, the second thing is I want to encourage our, our my local community um, to continue to be thinking about giving to the local mission of the church. In so many ways, this online has opened up a heap of new, uh, what I call kingdom access points <laughs> to expand the kingdom. And so we do that locally as well through heaps of different ways. And so just want to encourage us, church, to continue to be considering what we're time and prayer and finance um, towards their local community. Lastly, if you're someone watching this and you're not from my local community and you would like to support us in some sort of form, if you can see the benefit of this ministry, this stuff does cost. It costs time, it costs people. I'm looking at someone right now, and it costs equipment and, and all of that. And so if you'd like to support us and you're not from the local community, then you can reach out to us at admin at bcc.org.au. That's coming up now. Or you can comment or private message from however you're watching this. And uh, we can we can find some ways that you can assist or help or whatever it looks like to keep this online ministry going in this form. All right, that's my little announcements. <laughs> Let's get back to the actual scripture that we've been looking at through this series. And it's Galatians 5, 13, 26. We've been through this this whole series, so you should almost know it off by heart. Let's go. Galatians 5, 13 to 26. You, my brothers and sisters, this is a letter. If you haven't joined us already, Paul is writing to the church, writing to the people, the followers of Jesus. And he's talking to them about these two options that you can go. You can go back into your striving, your effort, your law, or you can be released by the Spirit and walk in line with that. And what happens is you produce this fruit. So you, my brothers and sisters, you are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. So you can have this all this stuff you strive to do. Or he's saying, guys, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So he says, I say, walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. The acts of the flesh, so he talks about the cheap, easy things that we just can do any, any time without effort. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Living like that will end badly. 
You don't even need Paul to say that. Just look at anyone that's lived just by their desires. Doesn't end well. But the fruit of the Spirit walking a different path is joy, love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. How do we cultivate? Today we're going to be talking about peace. As we've discussed all along, these fruit are not something that you just go and get. (laughs) but they're things grown. And the same is true for peace. Sort of. (laughs) You see, there's kind of two ways we speak about peace. Two ways described in the Bible. There is a state of peace that is described in the Bible, a end goal, if you like, a time of no war, no suffering, a time when peace will transcend all understanding. And we find this peace in two places in the Bible. In all the libraries of books, there's two places, the beginning and the end. So there is a state of peace when all eyes are dried. There is a state of peace. There is a location that's found at the beginning and at the end. In Genesis, there's a time where we are right with God, it says. We're actually in that state of peace. We've got outside peace. We are connected with God, peace with God, as God calls this shalom, meaning harmony, harmony with God. But we've also got peace within ourselves because we know who we are. We know what we're created for. Both pieces are present in the beginning. But then we go ahead and want to be God. And the rest is literally history. And that state of peace is gone. And now we live in a time, or we have so since then, where creation yearns for peace. We have war, we have famine, we have rumours of war, we have corruption, we have sickness and death. We might get glimpses of this state, but then something else contributes. The next wave comes. We still are never finding that full state of peace. I mean... Yeah, I don't even have to convince you. Look at the West at the moment. We nearly have everything we could ever need. Seriously. But America at the moment has whispers of civil war, (laughs) at least civil unrest, Um, (laughs) because they're not getting everything they want, even though they have everything they need. The world keeps the waves coming. Think about this. Our inner self is also so restless constantly. Identity, needs versus wants, rest versus busy. We're not at peace at all as humankind, which is horrible. This means that we can be sitting at home surrounded by two TVs, a house over our head, a family, running water, food, and we're looking on Instagram and wanting more. There's a state of peace we cannot find. It's horrible. We find ourselves literally sometimes in a living hell. Funny that because the wages of sin is death. And so the fruit of rejecting God is hell in a sense, yes, eternally, but also a sense of hell in our inner lives now where we're never at peace. Here's the good news, though. The library of books known as the Bible completely speaks to this. In fact, this is how it describes peace. Listen to this. This is a um, a, a verse that some of you be very familiar with. If you're actually part of our church community, we have this on the wall in part. You would have heard this verse that says, Be still and know that I'm God. But listen to the whole passage. God is our refuge and strength and ever presence help in trouble. There will be not fear through the earth will give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Listen to the context. This is not a great thing he's explaining entirely, the, the heart of the sea. Through its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Doesn't sound great. There is a river 
whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says... Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. And the God of Jacob is our fortress. Psalms 46, a picture painted of a person being asked to be still amongst constant chaos. The Bible doesn't picture or paint a picture of be still. Only when you finally got that chai tea on the back, on the back balcony watching the sunrise. <laughs> it's be still at every point. Such is the depth of spiritual fruit. John 14, 27, Jesus talks about peace when he is leaving. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 talks about peace in anxious times. 1 Peter 3, 9, 11 talks about peace during a disagreement. Scripture goes on and on discussing a peace that is just not something you arrive at or finally can get. It's a peace that is grown through all times, good and bad, through all storms. Even though the earth <laughs> they say, will melt, they're saying you can have peace. So this sermon is not going to be 10 quick tips to make your life more peaceful. I'm not saying today, it's not going to be now, make sure you make time for you. Have a spa day. Set yourself up a healthy retirement. Holiday often. These things aren't bad. Self-care is important and part of this, but this is a piece that isn't defined by your day isn't defined by the last holiday you had. This is a deep, true shalom with God. It's produced. It's peace in the storm, as well as the beach at Burley. Or do you know what? As well as the day spa. <laughs> it's a peace in all times. So let me read one final verse today and give you just three quick growing tips in cultivating spiritual fruit, in growing peace. This is Psalms 23. It's written by David. In a time of most of David's career, there was always times of war, or would he be king, won't he be king, and, and, and there was different times, and he wrote this amongst one of those times. Listen to this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Again, David zooms out, if you will, gives us context and says, even though right now I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, which doesn't sound like a great time, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David outlining his walk with God that produces peace even in the valley of the shadow and darkness, and death. It continues a process we've seen right through this series, releasing control and practicing hope. That's been the central theme coming out of these spiritual fruit. But here are three growing tips about producing peace. <laughs> One, be still. Learn the world doesn't revolve around 
or even revolve because of you. Stop. Be still. Make time to stop. Make time to stop. You will quickly learn that everything keeps running. (laughs) God still has it. I struggle with this heaps. That's why early on personally in my ministry, I had to almost be legalistic about it. And I didn't. I'm trying not to be. But just to make myself take a sad day Sabbath. Because I knew that if I didn't, I'd end up just working all sad day. And my family would pay for it. And I'd never be still. And I'd start to think, as I do towards the end of the each week, I get to Friday and I start to think the world needs me. <laughs> yeah, right. I take a day off. Guess what? The morning starts. Night still comes. The world doesn't need me. I can be still and know that I am not God. <laughs> but what's it look like for you to be still? Because I know there's work to do. Because I know you have heaps on at the moment. I know you're a bit under the pump. I know you're busy. But what does it actually look like for you to stop in that? To lay down, as it says in Psalms. To find green pasture. There's always another assignment. There's always another struggle. There's always another bill. There's always another health issue. But we are asked to, to produce. We need to know who God is in this scenario and the best way. Scripture tells us, or one of the ways is to be still. Know that he is God and you are not. So be still. Number two, discernment. Increasing your understanding of God so that you can recognize both the staff and the rod, or I've named it the stick. Both the staff and the stick. What do I mean? Some seasons force you to stop. Some seasons teach you something. Some seasons are there to refresh and encourage. Discernment is seeing which one is the rod, the stick, which is sometimes a bit of a whack on the sheep. Come on, what are you doing? Wrong way. Or a staff. Sometimes it's an encouragement. Discernment is seeing the things, knowing what you're in and knowing Jesus is at work. Sometimes using the staff to say, come on, follow me. Here I am. Sometimes using the stick to say, whoa, (laughs) he's up there. I don't think he causes the storm, but he will use it. He will give you peace and he will teach you something in it, if you let him. And number three, perspective. I talked about these states of peace described in two ways, one at the start and one at the end. Shalom in full will come one day. We started with shalom both outside with the world and with God and in our inner life. Thanks to Jesus, who is called the Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace deliberately, and through his sacrifice, through the cross, we are now welcomed back into that state of peace. And one day, the rest of the world, the rest of the kingdom will come in full and we'll have both that state of peace and inner peace with our Creator. Remember this, you communion can help with this. Often we talk about the meal and remember the death of Jesus, which is good and right. But the meal also, realize this, foreshadows the meal to come with him fully restored. So if you know where this is all headed, this produces a sense of peace in us. Perspective. Know the peace to come. Know that in the end, despite the storms, despite the waves, you can have peace because you know how it all ends. You know where this all goes. And again, here I go again, you're going to say. This is why small community, small tables are important. They're not the answer, but surround yourself with people that help you with these three things, that help you be still. Find people that don't add weight to you. Find people that help you discern. It's always good to discern together, not blame, that help you see the widest perspective, not narrow your perspective. Your large church, your large table church should be doing the same. I don't mean to harp on this point, 
Well, I guess I do because I do. <laughs> I absolutely mean to harp on this point. No one is perfect, but if your faith community or your small table, whatever it looks like for you, is constantly anxious, constantly criticizing, constantly blaming, constantly about the things that will fall away, then what do you think that's doing for you? What do you think that's doing for the fruit that's meant to be cultivating? How's that helping your apprenticeship, your discipleship to God? I'm not saying you need to have a group that's happy, happy, joy, joy every second. I'm not even saying you can't, they can't help you pull up and say, hey, I think the shepherd might be asking you to change. I'm just saying this morning as I encourage us with stillness, perspective and discernment, find some people that can help point you to Jesus, his word, his ways, his peace. Find community like that. Find a tribe like that and help become a disciple of peace. So three questions to ask your community, whether that's one other person, whether that's three people over coffee, whether that's online, find some people to ask you these questions and ask yourself, what does it look like for you to practice being still? And then what things distract or stop you stopping? (laughs) Second question or line of questions. What things in your life at the moment feel like a staff or stick? What are the moments that God is using and what are you learning? Is God using a staff saying, come on, keep going? Or is God using a stick? Come on, whoa there, get back in line. And what's he teaching you? Ask each other this. And thirdly, how do you remind yourself of the wider hope we have in Jesus? Share. Is it a favorite song that every time you hear, you think of that coming hope and peace? Is it a favorite verse? Is it a practice? Is it something you do? Is it some liturgy? Is it, I don't know. Is it a picture? Is it seeing nature? Whatever it is, share that with some people. Encourage each other to find that perspective. Because there's seriously something profound in an anxiety riddle season as of 2020 that someone has grown spiritual peace. It's so attractive. (laughs) It's unseen. They're stable. They're not of this world. To see someone and to see them be at peace in this moment, in amongst the storm, is going to make people ask some serious questions. (laughs) Imagine being known as a community here in Burley or wherever you're from as a person of peace, as a community of peace. I reckon we should be praying for that fruit <laughs> and all of them, and let's let's pray right now. Father, this is peace is not a place that we have to reach out, the perfect holiday, the perfect retirement fund. The, it's not something we can solve, Father. It's a it's a shalom that comes from you in all seasons. Father, help us to stop, be still and know that you're God. Help us to discern when you're teaching us something, when you're trying to get us back. Or when you're encouraging us, help us know and help us get perspective that one day all this will fall away and we will be in the fullness, the state of peace. Creation will be at peace as will we be with you, Lord. Help us grow that. Help us find people that encourage us and challenge us to grow that. And Father, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.